Hey everybody, uh, let's look at the second set of terms. And some of these are going to be ones that are from a long time ago, and some of them are ones that we didn't really talk about. And I just wanna at least connect a few things to things you already know, just so that it's not a complete surprise. So if we think all the way back to the beginning of the year, we talked about memory. Uh, you might remember there was kind of these three uh, lengths of memory, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Uh, which is down here. So sensory memory is you take something in with your senses. Uh, you see something, there's light that goes into your eyes. If you don't pay attention to it, you're not even going to encode it. Okay. But if you do pay selective attention, it's going to go in your short-term memory. Uh, remember you can hold about seven items plus or minus two in your short-term memory or working memory. You're still working with those items. If you keep practicing them, uh, they might move into your long-term memory. Otherwise you might forget them. And then long-term memory is essentially limitless. Uh, you can hold it for ever, some of it. Sometimes it decays a little bit, but that's that. Now, uh, we didn't use any of these terms up here. Uh, we might have, our book might have mentioned information processing model as sensory, short-term, long-term. That's all that it is. It's also known as a three-box model. Um, some books call it the Atkinson and Schriffen model. I don't see that very often, but if you see three-box model of memory, they're just talking about that sensory, short-term, long-term uh, set up. So it's nothing scary. It's just something you haven't really heard of described that way. Okay, let's talk about amnesia a little bit. Uh, so amnesia, you're obviously forgetting something. If we talk about it as being psychogenic amnesia, that's a fancy word that basically means there's no reason why you're forgetting it. That's biological. So there's no like tumor in your brain that they can identify and be like, this is why you can't remember. So a lot of times all these kinds of amnesia where you're forgetting something are due to stress. They're due to all kinds of life events. Uh, most of it's not very common, but we did talk about a few different kinds. So uh, dissociative amnesia is where you are actually separating from something about yourself. So uh, you've separated from the fact that you played baseball. Uh, so you remember your whole life, but not any of your baseball career. So that's kind of strange. Or you might uh, dissociate from uh, having a certain sibling or something like that. So uh, it's not about a period of time. It's about a certain um, event or uh, like series of events or part information about yourself. Anterograde amnesia is when after some sort of stressful event, you can't create new memories. So you can't create new long-term memories. Retrograde is kind of the opposite. So that's where the traditional example where you uh, have some sort of incident, and then you lose a period of time before the incident. So you lose a week, you lose a month, you lose a year, whatever it might be. And then infantile amnesia, that's the one that's pretty normal uh, for everyone, obviously, which is that we don't really remember the first five years or so, at least three to four years, uh, just because our brain isn't developed enough. So we all have amnesia, just a few people more than others. Okay, going along with memory again, Remember, with memory and long-term memory, there's lots of different types. We talked about these different terms. Some of you especially got some of these mixed up, so they're worth talking about briefly here. So in general, long-term memories are divided into two major categories, um, declarative or explicit memories. So they're ones that you can explain or you can declare, you can talk about these memories versus implicit or non-declarative. Those are more movement-based. So of the declarative or explicit memories, there's semantic memories. Those are fact memories. You know, who is the president of the United States? Uh, what year was the Declaration of Independence signed? Those are all facts. Uh, they're not personal stories or facts. Episodic memories, on the other hand, are fact, are stories, sorry. So, you know, you can remember uh, being in middle school. You could tell stories about what happened in Mrs. Brown's class or something like that. You could, you could tell those stories. Those are episodic memories, not semantic memories. Um, one type of memory we didn't talk about is prospective memory or perspective memory, something that really you only see in humans, but this idea of thinking about and planning for the future. So just throw that out there just in case you see it. I, I don't think you will, but if you do, maybe that will jog your memory. As far as those movement-based implicit memories, the ones that are not as much focused around the hippocampus like the declarative ones are, but are more in um, the cerebellum, uh, procedural memories, those are basically there. A lot of emotional things. How do you feel? Uh, this particular breakdown is saying flashbulb memories fit there because you're not really processing it. 
Um, flashbulb memories, I want to just clarify, though, those are very emotional, episodic memories. So just be aware that uh, there's kind of some overlap there. But flashbulbs, super, super emotional, episodic memories. Okay, let's throw in a couple other terms from other units. Uh, one of them is instinctive drift. You first saw this on a flip lesson. Um, basically, it's this idea that, uh, you know, with a, with a lot of people, a lot of animals, you can give them rewards as positive reinforcement to get them to do things they wouldn't normally do. But instinctive drift says that essentially instincts kick in and even with rewards, you can't get animals to do certain things if it's just against what they instinctually do. You can't really train a rat to run backwards. You can't train a pig to do certain things. You can't train a cow to go down steps. You can't do those sort of things because it's just against what they do. So the term for that is instinctive drift. Um, another <laughs> area that trips some of you up, and you might want to go back and look at, uh, there is a flip lesson about this as well. If you are feeling like this is really difficult for you, the defense mechanism. So these are Freudian. So again, with defense mechanisms, we're talking about if there's a situation you come across in your life and you don't know how to handle it, uh, ideally you handle things head on. But sometimes we just can't. And in those cases, we use these as a mechanism to protect ourselves in different sort of ways. So uh, very quickly, repression, you are not thinking about it. It is uh, kind of unwillingly shoved deep down inside and you don't even know that it existed. Um, so it's not denial. Denial is you like claiming it didn't happen. Repression is like you don't even know that it happened. Uh, it's not active denial. It's just your brain decides you can't handle it. Regression is when you go back to an earlier stage of development or an earlier way of dealing with something. So if something doesn't go your way, you throw a tantrum. You kick and scream. You do whatever it might be. Sublimation is when you channel that feeling like anger or fear and you channel into something productive. So the example we used was angry running. Uh, get out all those feelings into your run. Denial we already mentioned, just claiming it didn't happen, being very adamant something didn't happen. It's not because you forgot about it. It's not because it, it's a defense mechanism. You're denying it actively to try to avoid it. Uh, reaction formation threw people off a little bit. So reaction formation is when you act the opposite way of how you feel because that's easier to deal with than dealing with it head on. So the stereotypical example is uh, like little boy likes a little girl on the playground. And so instead of like talking to them and trying to get to know them better, or not even little, like think middle school, they like go up and like punch them. You know, it's like, no, like what they feel is attraction, but how they acted out was like with hurt. Uh, that's reaction formation. It's weird. It doesn't make sense. It's a defense mechanism. Uh, displacement is when you take something out on somebody else. So those of you that are working retail right now, uh, there's a lot of frustrated, angry people out there and scared people. I'm afraid that you may have been the subject of some displacement. Uh, projection, uh, just like those project projective tests, like the Rorschach tests and the TAT. Uh, projection is when you take your personal feelings and you think that other people have them or you think that an image you know, shows that or whatever it might be. So if you're really worried about the AP test and then you think everybody's worried about the AP test, uh, they, they might be, but you might just be putting your feelings and thinking that other people have them too. And rationalization is when you explain everything away. So you give real reasons for what you're doing or what's happening, but they're maybe not the, the, the true reasons. So they're logical explanations, but they're not necessarily fully getting into why something may have occurred. Okay, another topic that's been a while since we've talked about dreams. Uh, why do we have dreams? There's a few different theories about it. Uh, one is that it's wish fulfillment. Uh, remember there's, with Freud, he thought that there is uh, the manifest content of your dream or like the storyline of your dream and also the hidden meaning, the latent meaning of your dream. So he's saying, you can't do everything during the day well, you're awake, it's just not socially acceptable, but in your dreams, you can live out all of your id's greater desires. Another theory here is information processing. Helps us consolidate our memories, physiological functions, kind of similar, but more just about biology. Maybe we just need to have 
the pathways active so that the, you know, the brain continues to work. Uh, the term out of all of these that is most likely to trip you up if you see it on the test is activation synthesis or activation synthesis hypothesis. Basically, this says that dreams are random, but kind of with physiological function, there's all these brain signals being sent out while you sleep because your brain looks like the brain waves while you're asleep look like you're awake. Um, and because there's all these signals going off, your brain's basically creating random, random things in your head uh, while you sleep, but they mean nothing. So dreams are meaningless. They're just kind of randomized things happening. And then they also mentioned this cognitive developmental theory saying that our dreams really reflect where we're at as a cognitive, at a cognitive level. So kids dream about different things than adults do. Okay, I want to talk about something that we usually talk about in class at the end of the year, but we haven't had a chance to. I want to mention it briefly since these terms have showed up on the AP test before. Uh, so there's two newer types of psychology. One of them is human factors psychology. One of them is IO psychology, industrial organizational psychology. Uh, a lot of these are studied in graduate school rather than at an undergraduate level, although sometimes there's some classes you can take. But if you go into human factor psychology, basically they're working on product design. How do you make products, especially make products safer with the way that humans think in mind? So when you're designing a car, where do you put the safety features? Uh, how do humans think when they're in emergency, what's the first thing they look at? So thinking about where people are going to look, how do you label things, and making things as easy for humans to use as possible. You know, creating a better design of a product. So it's very product driven. So it might not be the psychology that you think, but how do people think and apply it to development of things? The last, the other one here is industrial organizational psychology, talking about how uh, kind of workplace management, almost reorganization. How can you better uh, create a workplace that works together and where everybody is uh, working their best, uh, everyone's busy and productive. So sometimes a lot of IO psychologists are actually done as consultants, not all, but uh, where they'll come in and they'll give suggestions and whatnot about how to make a workplace better. Kind of a different feel than maybe some of you are aware of. Okay, let's go back to conditioning here for a minute. Uh, when we talked about normal conditioning the other day in the worksheet, we were talking about uh, operant conditioning with a puff of air and the blinking and eventually blinking to the tone. But second order or higher order conditioning is let's say that you are now blinking anytime that tone sounds, but before the tone, someone claps. So if there's a clap and you associate with the tone, which you associate with the air puff, you might eventually blink when you hear the clapping because you associate it all the way down the chain. Now this is going to be a weaker, uh, a weaker reaction than to just the tone. Uh, and it's going to be weaker, obviously, than the air puff, and it's going to go extinct faster. A lot of you mentioned that you need to brush up on the James Lang, James Lang Cannon Bard, and Schachter's uh, theories. A lot of you had questions about that. The big thing here is that James Lang and Schachter's are similar, except with the Schachter's, you need to have appraisal. So you need to look at the at the event and say, is this something, how am I supposed to feel? So I have bodily arousal, and then I have to evaluate it. Is this something that's scary? Is this something that's exciting? Um, and then you feel the appropriate emotion. In this case, fear. With Cannon Bard, things happen at the same time, whereas with the other ones, there's kind of this progression. Another term that uh, sometimes people miss is taste aversion, uh, specifically because sometimes it goes by the term Garcia effect. Uh, basically with this, we avoid food and drink that makes us feel ill. So if you ever get sick eating something, uh, then oftentimes you uh, will not eat it again. It only takes once to have it happen. So if you ever get sick after eating something and you don't like it anymore, that's the Garcia effect. Another term that gets mentioned in some books, but doesn't get mentioned in ours. So I just want to mention it. So if it does come up, you'll be aware. Something called the pre-MAC principle. Um, this deals with learning as well, just like taste aversion uh, does. But a lot of times if you were trying to get someone to do something that they, they don't want, uh, you know, you could talk about uh, like with 
some of these different conditionings uh, with operant conditioning. If you're giving 